If you are reading this, then I am dead and you are standing aboard the derelict Cyclone class patrol ship, the USS Mistral, with her engines dead and her electrical systems non-functional. I am, was, the XO of this vessel, Lieutenant Commander Ryan Simmons. Please, read this carefully. If you are an officer or an enlisted man in the United States Navy, this is an order. Scuttle this ship. Immediately. Do not finish this letter. Get off the Mistral at once and send her down. Consider this a quarantine scenario. All hands are likely dead. God help you if they're not. We are eight days out of Kirkwall, tracking an intermittent and scrambled distress call from what appears to be an Icelandic fishing vessel, the Magnus Daughter, deep in the no fishing zone of the North Sea. We found the vessel, or rather, we found a mile wide streak of oil and fragments, the largest of them still burning. The night before, the enlisted man on watch had reported seeing a flash of light on the horizon. The Magnus Daughter's crew was nowhere to be found, except for one lone fisherman, unburned and floating at the far end of the debris field. He had been shot in the forehead with a small caliber revolver. When we fished his pale blue corpse from the frigid water, he still clutched a fishing knife in one clamped hand. What we were able to piece together from the fragmented and confounding evidence was that for reasons unknown, the crew had been conflicted resulting in the murder of at least one sailor, and the eventual sabotage and destruction of the ship. Visibility was only a few hundred feet as we spent the next day drifting silently among the debris in hopes of finding a survivor. The crew was already visibly shaken by the discovery, the grim dread of the fog, and the lone smoldering pieces of the Magnus Daughter that collided with our hull unsettled even the most seasoned of us. We had expected an easy cruise and the simple retrieval of a dozen thankful Icelandic fishermen. What we got, at first, was a silent and oil slicked coated sea and a single corpse, and more than a few nagging questions. The Mistral had just been serviced, after an extended tour with the Atlantic Fleet and Bahrain, before her transfer to the North Sea. She was in good running order, so I can only assume that the initial mechanical failure was an act of sabotage, or an act of an external force. It happened the first night, when our final sweep had been completed, and we returned to the site of the Magnus Daughter's first transmission. There was nothing initially remarkable about the spot, a cold and lonely set of coordinates and little else. I was in my cabin, just settling down when the call sounded from the captain, offering little information, just a stern order to meet him on deck. Dressing quickly, I emerged from my cabin into a cloud of palpable unease and fear. The enlisted men and the junior officers were coursing through the ship towards the deck, like panicked rats. No one made eye contact or spoke. There was none of the usual gallows humor or camaraderie that bubbles up in situations of limited information just a grim inertia that pulled us out into the arctic night. On deck, the night was unnaturally clear and cold, and the bright of the stars burned into the frosty air. Around us in every direction, just a few hundred yards away, the fog and clouds whirled, as if held at bay by our presence. The captain was at the railing, leaning over along with the other men on watch. I approached him, Suddenly desperate and panicked to know what was happening. When I saw it, the light flooding up from beneath us. The sea was flat, like the surface of a mirror. The water was black, reflecting the pale pinpricks of the stars, but beneath the surface, something glowed with the cold light. Pulsating shapes of violet, green, and deep cobalt blue shone from beneath. They flowed and merged and shimmered silently deep below the glassy sea. We stared, two dozen men and women, struck dumb and horrified by the sight. There was a sense of scale that emerged from the fluid movements of the light. They seemed to be many fathoms beneath us which would make them terribly large and impossibly fast. There were no solid shapes and no disturbance of the water, 
just a deep field of liquid, flowing light. We watched for what seemed like hours, entranced by the mesmerizing ballet of cold light, a mere reflection of the northern lights. When it ended, abruptly, there were almost three simultaneous events. First, the lights seemed to contract, each mode freezing in place and collapsing like the iris of an eye in bright sunlight. Secondly, there was a tremor in the air that first raised the hair on the back of my neck. As the ghostly lights winked out of existence, it rose in intensity until I thought my eyeballs might shake their way out of my head. Through the fog of sudden pain, I heard a noise rising above the arctic wind, a humming vibration from the mistral herself that matched the electric shuddering in my skull. It was as if every light bulb aboard the mistral was suddenly flushed with power, flaring bright and buzzing noisily in their housings. And when the wines had reached their fever pitch, they began to pop and shatter among a shatter of sparks. From start to finish, it lasted less than two seconds, and we were left floating silently in the dark waters, beneath the starry sky, on a dead and crippled boat. The damage was invisible, without any obvious cause in total. Nothing aboard the Mistral worked. Each carefully crafted system of multiple redundancies had crumbled. Every light was shattered. And even the replacement bulbs and the small flashlights we all carried held fuses and useless filaments. Satellite phones, shortwave radios, all means of communication were useless bricks of plastic and wire. Every battery was dead. Every stereo system was silent. We were adrift, without sail or engine, isolated from the world by hundreds of miles of black and silent sea. The crew moved through the ship the first night like moles, fumbling through dark corridors with only a few pale green chemical lights to check each system. They relayed each disheartening message like a fire brigade through the darkness to where the captain and I stood on deck, trying to make sense of all the senselessness. At last, when nothing else could be done, I fumbled my way back to my cabin and tried to sleep. The darkness, feeling like an oppressive many-fingered hand, slowly gripping my chest. The next morning, I again took stock of our situation, hoping for some fragment of hope we had passed by in the night. The damage was total. We would have to find a way to send a distress call and hope that we had not drifted too far from our last known coordinates. The men may not have known the full details, but it was clear that from their haunted visages that they knew how dire the situation was. The first death was that afternoon. The sounds of screaming brought me to the deck and into the thick, heavy fog. High in the gloom, I could see bright, burning specks of light, descending slowly. My stomach turned. It was two signal flares drifting uselessly through the haze. Some dang fool had fired the signal flares. I burned with an unfamiliar and foreign rage and rushed through the fog to the foredeck, with hatred in my blood and my fists clamped tight. The scene that emerged from the fog broke me from my stupor. The enlisted man, a flare gun still in his hand, lay broken in a pool of blood. The captain stood over him, clutching the railing, driving the heel of his boot repeatedly into the broken mess of the boy's skull. I realized then that the screaming I heard, the high keeling wail was coming from the captain, his face in a rictus of animal rage. Around them was a small crowd, standing motionless and silent, watching like sentinels. The captain turned to see me and dropped into a crutch, his fingers wrapping around the flare gun, and he raised it level with my eyes. We stared for a long moment at each other. Our eyes locked as he panted heavily, his face lightly splattered with blood. The only sound was the wet gurgling exhale of the enlisted man's death rattle, a bubble of blood forming on his ruined face. I'd served with this man for nearly a decade. This was not the man I knew. This was a hollow imposter filled with violence and terror. I spoke to him then, in a soothing voice. I asked him to hand me the flare gun. He said nothing at first, and then spoke. His voice a tiny trembling sound that was swallowed up by the thick gloom around us. He murdered us, Ryan. The fog. The flares will never. He shook his head and clenched his eyes tight, as if he was trying to shake himself from a dream. Then he shuddered once, violently, his back arching like a seizure. 
This little freak has got us killed, he choked out. The flare gun waved in the air, and I took a step closer, reaching out for him. He then opened his eyes, and I froze again, as we stared silently at one another. You're gonna die here, he giggled quietly. I've always wanted to watch you die, you coward. He tilted his head back and laughed, one hyena-like bark to the gray sky, and then he put the flare gun into his mouth and fired, the last flare igniting and temporarily bathing his head in a halo of magnesium orange and smoke. He tumbled back over the railing. If there was a splash when he hit the water, it was swallowed by the fog. I stood for what seemed like a very long time. It slowly dawned on me that I was alone. The silent audience having melted away below decks, no doubt taking the grim tale with them. I feared for morale, an absurd concern, I realize now, but could not have been moved from the spot, as if sheer force of will would cause the sea to regurgitate this man, my friend. The first gunshot broke me from my revere. In the emergency lockers, I found that a handful of flare guns remained, and I stuffed one in each of my pockets, and then entered the dim passageway to below deck. Over the hollow retort of gunshots, other muffled sounds began to emerge. The choking sobs, the screams of pain and anger, all bringing the faint impression of the copper smell of blood. The dark was oppressive and thick as my heart rose in my chest. The pale fading light of the chemical glow sticks that hung at regular intervals illuminated the bare corridor, and I moved slowly toward my cabin. It had been sacked, and my service pistol was missing. The next two cabins held the corpses of junior officers, their broken forms still in their bunks. Skulls opened like the blossoming flowers under the point-blank shots. I felt the distinct and the irrational desire to run on deck and leap overboard, to swim away from the boat into an unknown sea. I gripped a flare gun and held it out ahead of me, less like a weapon and more like a talisman, and began to pace slowly down the corridor to the enlisted bunks. The door was wide open, and the smell of blood and fear and crap was nauseating. As my eyes slowly adjusted to the dim, I saw a field of bodies, torn, shredded, and shattered by bullets and makeshift clubs. A few of the men still moved, twitching slightly. I watched in frozen terror as one man, his face a mask of blood and rage, turned up his head to regard me, and with a very weak cry of rage began to drag himself with his arms, trailing a broken and shattered leg towards me. From the shadows, another form pounced on him, a boot digging into the wounded man's back with a wet cracking sound. I recognized the attacker's face in the green chemical dim, a quiet and bookish young man. Like the captain, this was not the man I knew. This was the beast that wore his skin. He reached down and grabbed the wounded man's jaw, thumb slipping into his mouth. The wounded man growled, a feral mindless sound, and tried to bite down, but his attacker gripped tight and pulled. The jaw came off with the sound of tendons tearing and the utilating shriek that vanished into the air. I was no longer breathing, holding silent at the entrance, but the attacker snapped his head up to me, nostrils flaring. The jawbone hit the floor with a meaty sound, and he lunged towards me with silent animal grace. I fired the flare gun, and it hit him square in the chest. His shirt caught fire, and all the air escaped his lungs with a sudden forceful exhale, but impossibly. He continued on towards me. As I passed through the portal and slammed the door shut, the fire had climbed into his hair, and he was squealing now, his clawed hand still outstretched towards me. I felt his impact against the door, and saw that nightmare visage wreathed in fire through the small porthole, lips already burnt away to reveal two rows of perfect teeth. He wailed and began to smash his burning form against the door. Once, twice, three times and then silence. I raised my eyes to the porthole and only saw the faint image of the burning shape as it disappeared into the darkness. All conscious thought evaporated, and I fled from that charnel house. I have barricaded all entrances to below deck now, and have doomed myself to a slow death at the hands of the enveloping cold. I can still hear the living ones down there, screaming and banging on the doors. They are not the men that I knew. I console myself with this thought as I leave them in the dark to starve or murder each other. 
if you have read this far and have not fled these waters, or God forbid, are still aboard the Mistral, then I beg you, again, leave now while you still can. Do not look below deck. There are none of us left to save, and certainly none of us worth saving. It's cold now, and the fading days surrender the wane gray light to the dark. There are no stars this night, nothing but the heavy blanket of night. If I could get below, I would find some way of destroying the Mistral, like the brave man of the Magnus' daughter. But it's too late. The most I can make of my last moments, as all my feelings flee my extremities, and writing becomes impossible, is a warning. Please, send us into the deep. Tell no one you found us, and never return. There are things and primal desires older than man, and forces beyond the grasp of our simple minds, and they dwell here, beneath the frozen sea. Mistman, written by Red Nova Tyrant. April 8th, 2019. I'll start this with a very simple point. If I stop posting, then something has happened. I might disappear, but I'm going to make sure that it's not without a trace. A lot of people have been getting this story wrong lately, and if these are my last words, then I want them to be the truth behind that night. One of my ancestors was known to have been accused of similar crimes, but his words were lost to time. That's why I'm posting this online, so that it's never lost, and so that my words can reach a wider audience. I should give a little personal information, so that something should indeed happen. You guys can link it back to this. My name is Mallory, and I live in the coastal town of Nova Scotia, Canada. That's about all you need. Some of you might already know who I am, where I live, just based on that alone. As for the rest, I'll let you do the minimal work it takes to find the articles about the murder, to figure out where I am. If you're that determined to hold a protest calling for my imprisonment or whatever you want on my front lawn, then you can do a bit of research. Who knows? Maybe during your reading you might see the police accounts that have proven my innocence. I guess people need someone to blame though, hence why I see so many comments online putting me at fault for Jake's death. And yes, after I tell my story here, you might even further be convinced that I killed Jake, but I won't get anywhere by saying I didn't do it. So here goes nothing. Jake Makeliode was my best friend. I don't mean that in a mournful eulogy way that people talk at a funeral. He was truly my closest friend. We met back in grade school, and we had each other's back ever since. After graduation, we both found jobs within a small town. Jake at a gas station and myself at a fast food place. Jake always liked cars and working around them, so he was content with his job. As for myself, I didn't really know what to do with my life yet, so the fast food joint was better than nothing. At least I got to know the locals. That was nice. March 27th. It was a cold Sunday night. Typically, we'd go out on Saturday to the bar for some drinks and billiards. Jake hadn't been feeling very well Saturday, and I had to work an extra shift, so we decided to meet up the next night instead and suffer the consequences come Monday morning. I would have been fine with meeting up the next week and just skipping this one, but Jake said that he really wanted to talk to me about something, so I agreed. So there we were, in the bar, sipping beer and knocking balls in holes. The dizzying noise of bar chatter and bad radio music in the background. After having lost my fifth game of the night, Jake called for a break. We took a seat in a booth, and after a few moments, he decided to finally level with me. Mallory, he said. I'm leaving town. He told me that he had been offered a new job out of town as a mechanic. His girlfriend was planning to move to the area as well for her own schooling, so it was a win-win for them. Unfortunately, the place was not a 15-minute drive away, meaning that it would be harder for us to hang out, and he was leaving within the week. It hurt a bit, since almost every friend I had had already left and moved away too. But I understood how much this meant to him. Jake loved cars, so this was a big step up for him, and I couldn't let myself get in the way. Besides, this was the 21st century. We could still easily keep in touch, but breaking this tradition of weekend pool night was definitely saddening. He could tell it upset me a bit and brought me another beer, but I smiled and told him that it was alright. We stayed there a bit longer, played one more game, and then left. 
It was about midnight by the time we left the bar. Since it wasn't too far, we chose to take a short walk along the waterfront. Winters are long and annoying here, in the Maritimes, so there's still a few tiny chunks of ice floating in the harbor. The sidewalks were slippery still, some spots covered in treacherous black ice, others holding the dirty mountains of snow still melting away. The waterfront was empty, and so in our adult states under the lights of the street lamps, we laughed and joked for no reason. Now, we were passing by one of those piles of snow, and I decided it would be funny to start some 30 second fight with Jake. So chuckling to myself, I stumbled forward and reached for a cold, moldable solid and called out to Jake. Hey Jake! He didn't respond so I just figured he wasn't paying attention. Jake? I had the snowball formed as I asked again. No answer again. He didn't even say yeah or what, as I was hoping he would, so I turned and prepared to throw the snowball. I received a kick to the face in response. I didn't know what had hit me at the time, but regardless it was hard. Already teetering, my foot hit a patch of black ice and the next thing I knew I was on my back. There was a loud thud as my head slammed against the cement. Pain enveloped my head like a mother swaddling her child. Dazed, I reached back and touched my skull. It was leaking, just so slightly, leaving my fingertips stained red. As my eyes fluttered, I finally noticed that the streetlight had been blocked by a form. Focusing on it, I was able to discern what, no, who it was, and my heart felt like it had fallen from a great height. Jake was hanging there from the streetlight, and it was his flailing foot that had kicked me as he struggled to break free. I lied there, on the cold pavement, watching the life drain from my friend as he choked to death before me. My body wouldn't respond to any panicked prompting, and my vision continued to fade in and out. So all I could do was witness Jake's last moments of fighting, then twitching, before he finally went limp, drifting in the evening air, like a wind chime. Tears welled in my eyes, making it even more difficult to tell what was happening, and between fits of blubbering, I tried to call Jake's name. He wouldn't answer, though. He couldn't. My gaze was then averted to what was holding him up. It was a strange cord of bright white color, almost like its interior was filled with Christmas lights. Many thorns stuck out along the side of the robe, and I could see the dark lines along his neck where blood raised where they had pierced him. His face, thought now lifeless, was frozen in place, still holding all the last emotions that raced through his mind before death overtook him. Fear. Sadness, but most of all, desire. A desire to live. There was no knot or noose of any noticeable sword to break his neck. It was simply slung around his neck to make him suffocate. His hands were still clamped around the rope, as though he could still try, at any moment, free himself from the travesty and save his life. But it was not to be. I was to stay there on the sidewalk with my best friend now swinging from a lamppost. Then, and only then, my spine shook, as a thought occurred. I looked around anxiously from my position on the ground, trying to find the perpetrator of this act, before I met the same fate, or worse. My eyes darted up and down, left and right, but without being able to move my head. I was rather limited to how far I could see. So in the end, I could only wait for him to reveal himself to me. And reveal himself, he did. From what seemed to be like out of nowhere into my field of vision came the ghastly face of a man. It glowed almost like the rump, white like sea foam and cold as the ocean, but wispy and translucent. He looked to be in his mid-thirties, but I couldn't discern any real features to identify him. Everything on his face kept shifting eerily. His eyes frightened me the most, or what appeared to be, lack thereof. Then, slowly but surely, a closed-lipped smile formed on his haunting face. And it continued to grow, larger than should be possible. And yet his lips stayed tucked together. That uncanny smile, as his eyes burrowed into mine. It's an image that is burned into my memory, right between many images of Jake's swaying corpse. I try to utter a question, a demand, anything 
a why, a who, a what, but no words left my lips. And once I was thoroughly traumatized, the man simply stood up, turned, and began to walk past Jake, coattails flapping in the wind, before vanishing on the spot. That's when I was finally able to scream. The night air was cold. It found the cracks in my jacket's defenses and began setting upon me without mercy. I continued crying out for someone, anyone, to come to her aid, but no one came. I didn't want to look at Jake, but there were no stars to see on that cloudy March Eve, and so I was forced to think back through all of our memories together as my weariness overcame me. The next thing I can remember is the different feeling against the back of my head. It was soft and comfortable, and of course, I realized soon enough that it was a pillow, but it wasn't my own. You all know how recognizable one's bed is, so the moment that I knew that this wasn't my bed, I shot awake, and the pain came searing back as I was blinded by a white blur. Memories of the murderer's face raced through my spinning mind, but once I calmed down, I was able to make out where I was. It was the local hospital. My parents were quite tearful and relieved to see me awake. There was a lot of hugging and crying and, yeah, that kind of mess. But the celebrations had to be put on hold, now that I was awake after what I was told was three days of sleep. The doctors wanted to speak with me. The police as well. I immediately asked about Jake, with a slim hope that he too may have been just knocked out. But the officers wanted me to answer their questions first. I told them everything I just mentioned the night at the bar, walking on the waterfront, being kicked in the face and falling down, watching Jake's body flail around, and finally, the misty-faced man smiling down on me before disappearing. Once I had finished telling my side of things, one of the officers coughed and asked if I was certain about the hanging. I shouted at them that I was dead certain. How could I not be? That image was burrowed into my brain. Then the cop looked at me in the eyes and replied, we found no rope or anything of that sort at the crime scene. Jacob MacLeod was found dead on the ground, next to you with several lacerations around his throat. Small but deep. The tornado returned to my brain and began to scramble my thoughts. The officer asked if the man had perhaps taken the rope away with him, but I clearly remembered that he just disappeared and leaving Jake up there. They just repeated that he was found lying on the sidewalk with me, a light layer of snow beginning to build on top of us both. From the way he was positioned, they were also able to discern that he hadn't fallen from that kind of height, but that he just went from standing level to the ground. I asked how we were found. The bar closed about an hour after we left, and one of the young couples that had been visiting the area decided to have a romantic stroll in the snow along the waterfront. They then bumped into two dead bodies on the ground. Well, one nearly dead and one certainly dead, and they called 911. Services didn't arrive until after I was unconscious, so the officers suspected that the killer may have returned to collect the rope for whatever reasons. As for the misty appearance of the suspect and the rope, they chalked it up to alcohol. Something something brain injury. They didn't doubt my story, saving the whole rope thing, and they figured that the suspect must have thought he succeeded in getting us both. The doctor told me that I received a concussion, and that I had to stay with them for a few more days before they'd let me go, since I hit my head pretty hard. So about a week later, and after some more tests, I was released from the hospital and sent home. I just crawled back into bed, depressed by the loss of my friend and terrified that the killer might spot me and try to finish the job. Rumors began to circulate. They thought that I didn't want Jake to move away for some insane reason and took the most drastic measure to stop him from leaving. Really? Like seriously, how does that even remotely sound logical to you? But emotion overwhelms reality, I suppose, and so that those grieved for Jake pointed a finger to blame at me, either for committing the act or not helping prevent it. But I know what happened. I know what I saw was real. That misty-faced man, the thorn-covered rope, their ghastly appearances, pieces of their form, wispy and flowing in the wind like strands of hair. And that cruel stare, that malice-ridden smile, there was nothing earthly about that man. I don't know who or what the hell he was, but 
that was not a living person before me that night. My blood ran cold when his eyes bore into mine, in a way I never experienced before. No man could strike fear like that into someone's heart, and no man could simply extinguish on the spot, to just vanish into the wind. As if my fears are correct, then it's likely he knows that I lived, either through some sixth sense that the undead possess, or perhaps he just keeps up to date with the local news. It could have been a hallucination, sure, but either way, I doubt he'll want to keep me around for much longer. I'll keep updating this blog with more information regarding the case, if I'm still around to do so. If not, then this has been the truth. Goodbye. April 19th, 2019. He came back, and I don't know what to do now. I'm just going to assume you've read my first post, since I don't want to relive those memories right now. Not with everything that's happened, and it's a waste of time. Also, thank you to Mary for just throwing my name out there despite my desire to stay somewhat anonymous. And I'm sorry. For those curious, I've already deleted the comments, so, yeah. I didn't attend Jake's funeral. I got a lot of reprimand for that, but I was terrified for some reason that his killer would be there, getting some sick kick out of watching his victim being lowered into the earth. I didn't leave the house for a good week, cowering under my sheets and reading the responses to my first blog. I would only leave my room to get food or use the bathroom, only to return quickly to bed and mindlessly watching YouTube videos to take my mind off of things. My parents checked on me daily, but they mostly left me to my own devices. They figured that this was just a coping mechanism. The police continued investigating to an extent, but with no real leads to go on. Things were moving slowly. I attempted to do research about that thing, the Miss Man. But every time I tried, those dang images would fill my mind. First Jake, then the smile, and Jake again. Then, akin to holding one's breath and running through a cemetery, I managed to swiftly enter a search result. Misty Ghost Killer. I wasn't really expecting much, nor should I have been. And naturally, it didn't return any relevant information. Just a bunch of spooky ghost stories for me to indulge in and haunt myself with even more, should I choose to. I avoided them like the plague. It stormed one night, one of the first heavy spring rains. The wind rattled against my shutters all night long, forcing me to stay awake in case he showed up, even if it was only one knock, just to mess with me or something. Not that my sleep schedule wasn't already ruined. And so there I stayed, locked away in my room by my own doing. Swiss army knife always in hand should the Miss Man come for me. I only left the house one other time before the second incident, and that was for a doctor's appointment. Just some basic stuff, checking on how I was doing. If my head felt funny, if I was coping well with losing my friend. The doc took notice of my reclusive behavior, and said that if my mood continued for too long that they might direct me to a therapist for additional counseling. Great. Then, Morgan messaged me. He left a comment on my last blog, alongside trying to contact me in every shape and form. I didn't respond because, again, no interest in going out into the open. Thank you. But Morgan is the persistent type, and a few days ago he showed up at my door. Mom let him in, and he was pretty well dragged me down the stairs to go outside. Lily was with him, another friend from school. Seeing her made me quite happy. I'll admit it now, yes, I had had a crush on her for a bit, but never really did much about it and just tried to suppress those feelings after high school. As my behavior should tell, I'm not the bravest man on earth. Morgan and Lily had come along to make me breathe some fresh air instead of that depressing stink of my fifth day worn jeans. I mumbled something about being busy, but it was easily overpowered by my mom saying it was a fantastic idea, which left me no options. It wasn't a clear sunny day, but one of those days where the sky is covered in the clouds, ready to burst, and there's a light mist in the brisk morning air. So, soppily pulling out my raincoat, I found my shoes and stumbled out to meet my old classmates. Now Lily was in a lot of my classes over the years, but Morgan and I only really got to know during the last year of high school. But that didn't stop us from bonding over online games and such. We made such a great team, the three of us. Gosh, Morgan seemed to deal with the loss far better than I, but he was also a really determined guy. 
he'd persevere through anything with a grin on his face. Lily was more timid, and not much for talk, but she was still quite sweet when you did interact with her. We wandered into town and stopped by an ice cream parlor, where between comforting bites, I retold them the painful story. Wandering on through town, our shoes clapped against the wet cement. It was nice being around other people again. But before long, I'd grown distracted and didn't notice where we had ended up. We were back on the waterfront. Not on the same spot as before, but it was enough to strike my heart with anxiety. A hand on my back made me whirl on the spot and nearly trip, scaring a shy Lily and a friendly Morgan, whose hand was taken aback by my reaction. Come on, he replied. Let's go somewhere else. The sun stayed hidden and the air stayed damp. We had passed the high school and we were now strolling through the suburbs, passing along a large hedge. That's when Lily asked her first question since we met up. Do you really believe that Jake's killer is a ghost? I stopped for a moment, beginning to doubt myself. It all could have been as the doctor described, just a hallucination in a high-stress situation, mixed with alcohol and hitting my head really hard. But that cold, that fear he put me into, that was real. I don't really know, was all I could say, because I truly didn't. And that was worse than having an answer, because I had no idea what to expect from the murderer. That's why I was frozen on the spot when Morgan's face exploded. Pieces of brain matter and blood splattered all over my jacket sleeve. But my brain was just caught off guard, so hard that its wheels were spinning in mud. Lily's scream became muffled and distant as I tried to comprehend what was happening, so I could react properly, but it took far too long. And as Morgan fell to the ground, out of my line of sight, I was greeted with a more horrific sight. The shining white barrel of a gun, with its entire body seemingly smoking from that one shot. Lily's touch finally broke me out of the trance and I began to move in the direction she was pulling me in. I was glad I got to hold her hand in that moment. It was a strange comfort while trying to avoid being killed. But nothing good seems to last for me. Lily screamed again as she was jerked back and when I turned, I saw that the mist man's ghastly hand clutched her hair ferociously, refusing to let her escape. Let her go, I howled, pulling on her hand as hard as I could, but, but it was for naught. I saw the purest form of shock and terror ripple through her face as the fiend yanked her back and stuck her in the back with a knife. I kept pulling in a futile attempt to save her life, but Lily did not move. All she did was jerk and cry out as the man struggled to drag the knife up and through her body, only being able to do so by thrusting it upward so far before having to thrust it again. And when he couldn't cleave bone, he withdrew the knife and stepped away. Lily dropped into my arms, and I held her as I kneeled on the pavement. I watched as the last pieces of her consciousness faded away her eyes eliciting the same fleeting life that Jake's spasms contained. I had no words for her, only tears flowed. I couldn't even bring up the courage to say, I'm sorry, or I love you. All I could do was cry out and take in the image of her face, glancing at Morgan to mourn him as well. But he, he wasn't satisfied with just their lives. He wanted to burn me, to torture me. With a strength I never expected, he ripped my sweet lily from my hands and swung the knife around her horribly, destroying any ounce of her former beauty in seconds before letting her drop back to the ground, like a child bored of the ragdoll. My brain screamed not to look. It wished to keep the memory of her face from only seconds before, but everything felt slow. I could not take my eyes off of her as the man took her from me, and so the mess of flesh and scars was a sight to behold. I sat there, bawling for the dead, before looking up and finally getting a look at my assailant. I had called him the Miss Man before, but to actually see him drove the name home even more. His entire form was drifting and flowing, yet there was no wind on the road. He wore an old-fashioned trench coat, similar to one a sailor might have tattered and ripped in several places, yet swaying in the breeze like the retreating mists. The shoulders had parts standing up like sharpened spikes. Hanging from his side was an equally old flintlock pistol, the same gun that took Morgan's life. The knife rested in his hand, but it did not drip with crimson red. 
but a fluid that matched the unholy white of his body. He had one of those sailor-style hats as well, the one shaped like a triangle, and it hid the top half of his face. Only upon lifting his face to greet me did I once again feel the unrelenting power of his stare, and the cartoonish smile scrawled across his face. There's nothing left to do. Slowly, I crawled back from the specter on my hands, keeping both eyes fixated on the creature. Before scrambling to my feet and sprinting for my life, screaming through the neighborhood for somebody to help, my eyes were blurred by tears, so I nearly ran down the first person I ran into, an old man walking his dog. I grasped his arm shakingly and pointed down the road, telling him about the mist man and what he had done. The guy craned his neck down the road and his eyes widened before answering, Oh crap, come on, come on, he's coming. I did not want to look behind me, out of fear that I'd freeze up yet again. I just listened and followed the fellow, who I later learned whose name was Gary, to his house. Gary locked the door behind him and told me to go down the hall into the kitchen and call the police. As I did so, I could hear Gary rushing between rooms upstairs, and just as I finished explaining the situation to the police, he returned. In his hand, his own rifle. What kind, I have no idea, but seeing it both frightened and reassured me that I'd be alright here. Gary asked for the phone and I handed it right over. He explained the situation to the police as well, saying how we were in his house at this address and we had locked the doors and closed the curtains. We were told just to stay on the line and wait for the police cruiser to arrive. The ensuing wait was the longest and quietest wait of my life. I nearly had a heart attack when the operator asked if we were still on the line, other than the occasional yes or no into the telephone and the ticking of the clock's pendulum. Gary and I waited in near-complete silence, listening intently for any sounds of an intruder attempting to finish off the only two witnesses to his crime. In that time, though, the images of my dead friends ran on repeat, no matter how hard I tried to push them down and concentrate on the here and now. With the sound of the siren approaching, the operator told us that the police had arrived. I thanked her quietly, as knocking could be heard from the backyard. I swallowed and looked at Gary, whose face went flush like mine. We both turned and out the glass patio door we saw him. There was another knock now from the front door, and I screamed, Help! He's in the back! Gary put his rifle in the corner and pushed me to the front door, both of us scrambling along the way. I reached the lock and undid it, allowing the police to run through the kitchen. I frantically pointed in the direction of the mist man, and they seemed to understand well enough. Gary and I were escorted over to the police cruisers, open to the curious eyes of the neighborhood. I could make out people standing in their living room windows, gawking at the scene, but it couldn't be more uncomfortable than the situation I was just in. They wanted to ask us some questions, of course. One of the officers had been there during my recovery at the hospital, so I was more reassured talking to her. I told her everything you've already read above, but unlike at the hospital, she wasn't so kind. A hint of doubt clouded her eyes, and every look she gave, each raised eyebrow, only made me worry. Then she asked to do a pat-down. My heart finally sunk, but I agreed, thinking I was just overreacting to all of this and that everything was going to be okay. I'd forgotten about one crucial element, though. My knife. Next thing I know, I'm being put under arrest for reasonable suspicion involving the murders on that street. Waiting in the interrogation room, my anxiety was only peaking. The only thing that kept me restrained and not lashing out wildly was that I was innocent. The Mallorys had a bad history of being falsely accused of crimes. My own dad was nearly thrown in jail for sexual assault against a woman he'd never met. So it seemed to be a genetic thing, that we grow more restless and angry than the average person when this kind of thing happens. But I didn't have the same self-confidence as my predecessors. I was scared, terrified that I was going to be locked up after having witnessed my three closest friends being executed by some demented maniac set on ruining my life. The cops eventually came in and began the questioning. We went in circles for a while, with little progress being made. When I was asked about the real suspect, they told me that the one officer had made chase, seeing his coattails leaping over the bush in Gary's backyard, but lost sight of him shortly after. They asked why I had a knife. 
I told them it was in cases of situations like this. It was the truth, and I hoped it seemed reasonable enough. The interrogation continued, but there wasn't really any kind of confession they could get out of me. I knew what had happened, and Gary corroborated my story. He had seen the figure approach, and when it knocked on the patio door. My knife had no traces of blood on it, and there were no guns around the scene of the crime that could have done the damage to Morgan's face. So they had no choice but to let me go. However, they stated that they were going to keep a close eye on me, both for my protection and others. I understood their concern and thanked them. On my way out, the female officer whose name I finally learned, Riley, asked me a question. Mallory, is that the name I'm thinking of? The whole folk legend name? I sighed. Yeah, it is. I suppose a quick history lesson is in order by now. The Mallorys came to the town near the beginning of the 1800s, but there was an old rumor that surrounded the first settlers of my family. Apparently, back in Europe, wherever my family originated from, one of the brothers of the guy to first come over was executed for mass murder. There wasn't any proof of this event, but people still affirm that it happened. My grandfather was into genealogy while he was still alive, and even he couldn't find anything about a Mallory committing such a crime in the history books. It was just a rumor, but it was one that made the family name look bad. Think of it like having a friend with the last name Hitler. Okay, maybe not that bad, but you get my point. Locally, we were the ones to watch out for. Hence, my childhood was made all the harder because of it. Parents would tell their kids to stay away from the Mallorys, that they caused bad times wherever they went, and so most of the kids either stayed away from me or bullied the heck out of me. Jake was the only friend I had growing up, and then later Morgan and Lily hung around me too. Anyways, now the police have their eyes on me, and I have committed to staying in my room almost entirely. Back to where I started, I suppose. Only with less. Jake, Morgan, Lily, people's trust in me, all gone. The Mallory name is starting to live up to its reputation, and that scares me. May 2nd, 2019. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't explain right now, but I promise too soon, please. Believe me. I didn't do it. I'll tell my story soon, but you'll have to wait a bit. May 3rd, 2019. So, as most of you who regularly tune in may have heard, the man appeared again, and he killed. Again. It was cruel. It was horrific, and yet again, as weak as this excuse may be starting to sound, I did not do it. This is not some case of the little boy who cried wolf. In fact, it's the very opposite of that tale. The wolf is here, and I've been trying to warn you all. It's the townspeople who refuse to believe. I'll have to make this as quick and thorough as possible. Two terms that don't go together easily. I'm not writing this from my own computer, so please forgive me if I don't have the time to have a great recap on what's already happened. Even these two paragraphs are wasting valuable time. I could be used to prove my innocence. So I'll wrap it up here, and just get to the truth. It was not long after the second incident. I had another doctor's appointment, so my mother drove me to the hospital. The lobby was moderately busy when we arrived, so we had to sit down in the waiting area for a while. The whole time, my paranoia was prevalent. My foot refused to stop bouncing against the floor, and I was constantly scanning my surroundings for any sign of the mist man. A small breeze from a passing patient would startle me, causing my head to whip around and confront the person that had made it. I was barely able to stop myself from screaming at them to leave me alone and to stop hurting my friends. The look in my eyes was enough to freak them out, though. That ravenous primal sense of alert I'd seen in the mirror every morning after a tiring night of waking up repeatedly in fits of screaming. When the doctor finally came to see me, my mom let me go in on my own. She figured I'd be more comfortable talking to the doc if it was just between us. I managed to give her a small smile of thanks, the first remotely happy face I'd been able to put on in weeks. I followed the doc through the disinfected halls, seeing some patients being rolled out on beds or Escorted by relatives, the smell of rubbing alcohol was palpable, stinging the inside of my nostrils. 
We sat down in his office and got right to it. He did some standard health tests before we got to the questioning. He asked if anything hurt. I said my head was fine. Did I have sleeping problems though? Yes. Every night I watched the mist man kill my friends again and again before grabbing me by my throat and choking the life out of me. He took note of this, then asked if I was eating well, getting out of my room when safe, etc. My behavior had not changed much, so I told him the truth. Once we were done, the doctor told me that I likely needed more specialized help and that he was going to refer to me to a therapist for my mental issues. While I'd come to the hospital just a few more times to check on my head, Disgruntled, I accepted the slip of paper with unrecognizable gibberish and thanked him before leaving. Now the hallway was no longer busy. I could hear people whining and babies crying. Something in my heart dropped like an anchor, and I began to jog down the hall, only to round the corner into the lobby and see him there yet again. He stood in the center of the room, only staring in my direction with that same unnerving smile across his lips. I could see his knife in his left hand and dripping once more with the milky white fluid. Swallowing, my eyes slowly drifted to his right, where his hand gripped the collar of my mother's blouse. Her eyes stared blankly to the ceiling as blood rushed from her neck, a large and horrific cut running down her throat. Tears welled in my eyes as I watched the skin begin to tear, the cut opening around her neck, before finally meeting in the back as the monster tore her head from her body spinal column dangling below. Others in the room couldn't contain themselves and began screaming. A few lost their lunches. Myself, however, felt something different. Through all the horror and grief bypassing the flashing images of my dying friends, one feeling began to swell. Rage. As my blood boiled, I looked to my right and saw a hospital cart with surgical supplies. I grabbed a scalpel and gripped it tightly. My breath grew heavy, starting to quicken, and I waited until I could overcome my fear and let my rage take over. If I didn't try to stop him now, there would be no overcoming him, ever. But my anger did not overpower my fear yet, and so I swallowed liters of saliva and stared down the mist man while frozen on the spot. He simply continued his strange smile and dropped my mother's head to the floor before turning away. What came next? Oh gosh... I wish I could forget. It's a sight I wouldn't wish on anyone, but I need you all to know my pain, to know how much I've lost, and how evil this thing is. He killed them all. I'd never seen anything move so fast. With every blink, the mist man was standing before another kill, his blade driven deep into the gut or neck. I tried to keep my eyes open for as long as possible, thinking it would stop him from moving if I didn't close them. But the tears forced me to blink, and so I killed each person in the lobby by not acting. I saw him drag his knife across a man's eyes, blinding him instantly and letting him suffer. I saw him break open another kid's chest and flay his ribs outwards, exposing his beating heart for all to see until it stopped. An old woman stood no chance to the beating and impalement she received from an IV stand. You might ask yourself, why didn't anyone run? Why didn't anyone scream for help? They tried. I saw a few people earlier get up and sprint for the doors, or call out for help, but the instant they tried, a rope of thorns would shoot across the room from his hand and grab the person by their neck, before slowly dragging them back. I could see the thorns grow to pierce the victim's neck, and their screams turned to gurgles as they choked on their own blood. And whether they were already deceased or not, the mist man would play viciously with their bodies methodically carving off limbs and stabbing them into unrecognizable slabs of meat. Freeze! The shout took me from my trance and I turned to my right to see two police officers rushing inside, guns drawn and aimed on the figure. Hope began to well up inside me. We were rescued. One of the officers looked at me. It was the officer that was at the last two incidents. She looked at me as if I was okay. I barely nodded my stomach doing flips from the overwhelming mixture of fear and joy. She finally saw him. She finally saw the mist man. She should have never taken her eyes off of him. The right side of her face began to rip and tear apart and her entire body fell to the floor. 
Various projectiles had flown into her, and all the senses of assurance was ripped away as I gazed upon her exposed cheekbone. Hearing a thud, I turned and saw the other officers on the floor, a freshly made hole in his face forming a well of blood. The rage began to flow again, this time overtaking my thoughts even quicker. I glared at the demon, whose head was shaking rapidly, yet without sound. A silent laugh and a bewildering smile. He was mocking all of those he'd slain, flintlock in hand. Enough was enough. My will to act outweighed my fear, and for the first time I lunged at the mist man. I drove the scalpel straight through his abdomen, only for it to pass through to the other side. He reared his head back and continued shaking it around maniacally, his lips not breaking contact. I raged on, slashing and stabbing, trying to hurt his back in some way to even the score. All the while, I could only scream one word. Why? Why did he kill Jake, or Morgan, or Lily? My mother, for what reason did she have to die? Or any of these innocents? Why wouldn't he just kill me? Grant me mercy from this misery and just end my existence. Why me? Why now? Why did I deserve this torture? The mist man's head simply kept on rattling, giving no answers to my pleas. And then, as I fell to my hands and knees, defeated and depressed for a third time, he carried off by a wind of unknown origin. His misty form was carried away, like dust in the breeze, with his smile being the last thing to go. I sniffled and cried, my tears falling to the blood-stained floor. I didn't care that someone's intestines were squished between my fingers. All I could do for those few moments were crawl over to where he had dropped my mother's hat and cradle her in my arms for just a brief few minutes. As I came to terms with the situation, I realized that the police would soon be there. There would be no getting out of this one. That is, if they caught me. I searched my mother's corpse for the keys to the family car, then hurried off outside and drove off. I didn't have a license yet, but I had been practicing. I could hear cop cars in the distance, but I never ran into them. Instead, I just chose a destination and drove. Even if they trace where I posted this entry from, or look for my car, they won't find me. Not yet, at least. I've already left the area, trying to keep my resolve and not steer off the road. And I've taken other precautions to avoid arrest as well. What those are, I won't say. They are likely using this blog to track me down. But I needed to tell the truth. That's all I've been doing since the day I started this. Trying to inform the world of what has really been going on. And warn you of the serial killer specter that follows wherever I go. I'm going to avoid people as much as possible for now. I won't want another killing to occur. But I'm also going to look into the history books and see if there's anything I can find about some kind of vengeful spirit that haunts you and kills those around you. I won't update until I find something. May 6th, 2019. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive my soul for I have ended your world. May 7th, 2019. I saw the ocean today. It looked like it was going to storm. The skies were gray, the wind was blowing, and the waves were choppy but there wasn't any rain. Typical weather for maritime, I guess. All the ice had melted by now as well. I'm sorry. I just needed something to start off with so I could get myself to begin the process of writing this final entry. Yes, this is the end. Yes, I found the truth. But finding it only cemented a horrific fate for the world, so tomorrow I'll be deleting this entire blog to prevent any more people from learning of the Miss Man. However, I feel that I owe those that have been following this for some time as an explanation. And besides, you're already part of the problem, so there's that. So the first thing I wanted to say is, I'm sorry. Not for deleting my last nonsensical entry that was posted in a moment of desperation and fear, but for the truth I'm about to tell you. After the hospital, I stopped by my house to grab a few personal items. The police car was gone, so I assumed that my family officer had followed us to the hospital and left a short blog post saying that I'd explain everything soon. Then I began driving for an old family cottage in a wooded area within the province. The area was a fair size, 
with one large log cabin and a big barn around back. All of the farmland from when my predecessors lived here was pretty much gone. You could see where it was. But the land would need extensive work to be used for such tasks again. The cabin was just about as old as the first Mallory's to settle here, and it was in surprisingly good condition, mostly thanks to the constant upkeep my family had put into it over the years. It was a meeting spot for the summer barbecues and such, but any other time it was left completely alone. I grabbed the keys from its hidden spot, dropped my stuff off on the door, then shuffled to the bedroom and collapsed into the sheets. I covered myself in the musty fleece blanket at the end of the bed and wept myself to sleep. I only dreamt of death, but my sadness kept me locked in the dream, and so I mourned for the lost souls through my dreams. The next morning I looked for some food, but naturally there wasn't anything around. I had to go to the nearby village, but I couldn't use my mom's car. If it was spotted, I'd be caught too quickly. I knew that my dad was keeping a motorbike in the barn here as a present for me when I got my license. So I swapped the car for it, fueled it up with some gas from the canister, and drove it around the lot a bit before trying the open road. I managed to make it to town on my own, and used some cash from my wallet to purchase the basics. Bread, milk, toilet paper, bologna, mustard. On my way out, I noticed that there was a library across from where I had parked. Debating with myself whether or not it was a good idea, I decided that it was probably the best place to go if I wanted to find any information on the Miss Man, so I took my groceries with me and headed in. The librarian was nice enough and she directed me to where the computers were. Guess this village didn't know how to look out for me yet. I thanked her and immediately got to work. I got to the chase. I didn't find anything. Mostly just medieval myths about ghosts that curse people to bad futures, or other monsters that killed loved ones but not their targets. But none of that helped me. Then I remembered the blog, and with painful recollection I recounted the recent events. The fact that I couldn't find anything out about this beast and yet I was still trying to convince you guys of his existence was upsetting, to say the least. I returned to the cabin and just went back to bed paranoid of either the cops or the demon finding me. The next two days were pretty much the same. I spent the day in the library reading and looking for answers, but to no avail. Back in the cabin, I did some scourging to find something to distract me and to get me out of the habit of moping around. There were some old books and stuff, but that was about it. I also had to chop some wood for the furnace that afternoon. Then came the evening of two nights ago. After two days of nothing to show for my research, I returned home yet again to a quiet cabin and a mustard and bologna sandwich. I decided to look around the cabin some more, try to learn about my family. I noticed a book on the high shelf that I couldn't reach, so I carefully shook the structure to try to make it fall. On that same slam that knocked off the book, something else fell from the top of one of the rafters. When the book just proved to be an old family album from the 40s, my interest returned to the unusual package that had fallen. It was a letter, tightly bound in a leather skin. Whoever wrapped it originally did not want anything to happen to it, but whoever had received it didn't seem to want anyone else to find it. So why not just destroy it? Opening it up, I found two distinctive different documents, mostly noticeable from the quality of paper. The first paper read so, these are the final words sent by my brother, Arthur Mallory. Though they contain the power to spread a curse most foul and cruel, I cannot bring myself to burn the last thing my dearest brother sent to me. I urge you not to read, but should you do so, you know that you're perpetuating a legacy of evil. Signed, Kenneth Mallory, 1814. I blinked and had to read those words again. Kenneth Mallory, the original Mallory to settle the Nova Scotia from Europe, which meant that the other paper pertained to his brother, Arthur, the brother that was rumored to have slaughtered many people himself. A chill sped its way through my spine. It sounded all too familiar, so of course I was frightenedly eager to learn what had happened to Arthur. The next section is a transcript of what I could determine from the contents of the letter. I warn you now, reading any further will cement your involvement in the problem of the misman. But again, to those who are stuck with me for this long, I feel like you have the right to know. So one last time, I am truly sorry. Dearest brother, 
I write to you from a jail cell. I know you plan to sail to the new world in only a month, but before you go, I wish that you would receive my words on the truth behind my imprisonment. You turned your back onto me when I told you that it was not my fault, and father and mother and all of our other brothers, and rightfully so. Only a fool would spout such nonsense to escape the punishment of his wrongdoings, under normal circumstances. But I tell you now, brother, what I did was for the good of mankind. You know that the village they claim I ruined? Yes? Well, I was traveling through the countryside with my wife, Hilda, when we came across it. The town was cold and miserable, with many downtrodden people wandering about it. When I asked what was wrong, I received no answer. I tried over and over again to get an answer, but no one would tell me the problem. Only when I saw the coffins being taken to the local graveyard, and the number of mounds of fresh soil. Did I know something was wrong? We went to the local inn and asked for a room. The innkeeper told me that I did not want to stay in the town and that I should travel by night as fast as I could to get out. I told him that he was crazy. I paid my fare and went to my bed. I woke in the night by a loud scream, and after telling Hilda to stay in bed, I rushed out of the building to see a man standing in the middle of the road. He looked like any other sailor, but an aura of malice extruded from him. His heel had stomped its way into the head of a villager, and upon his face he wore the devil's smile. But if these features were not enough to prove that he was the devil incarnate, his form that shifted like a roaring fire had to be. I called for him to stop, but he only looked at me with that ghastly look. Then the next thing I knew, he had vanished before my eyes. Not knowing how to respond, I retreated indoors, nuzzled up with my beloved wife, and held her close as I fell asleep. When I awoke the next morning, I was the one to scream as her mutilated face stared back into mine. Oh, Hilda! How I wept and wept for you, my angel. The innkeeper came upstairs, and when he saw me cradling her in my arms, I thought I was done for. But he simply sighed, saying that I should have left. She was buried that morning. He told me the story, or what there was to tell, of the creature over a series of pints the next evening. They had no name for it and it gave none to them. It had simply appeared one afternoon and killed three people in the middle of town square. When it was confronted, it summoned a mighty whip of thorns and slaughtered all those men by knocking their heads clean off their shoulders. The innkeeper then stated that it always seems to commit more foul deeds the more people had seen it, so the town had a general rule about not going out at night, and that if you heard someone's death cries, that you were not to go after them lest you see the creature with your own eyes and continue the curse. They had tried to send for help, but each time someone left town, they had been found hanging in the roof of the house the next morning. I stayed in my room for a couple of days, thinking on what I'd been told. I could barely sleep as more screams rattled through the village. Each one I felt personally responsible for, as I had gone out and continued the curse by witnessing it that had killed the villager. And in my deep depression, I had hatched a terrible plan. Having lost a good thing to come into my life since the end of my service as a soldier, I was going to save this village and all of Europe from disaster. Yes, I killed them. They were just farmers, simple townspeople. They were not hard to fight, but it hurt to kill them. But I had to. If they continued to see this monster, then the curse would continue on. So I slaughtered the townspeople, and I burned their village to the ground. But I wasn't going to survive either. I had to witness the demon's actions, and so I too had to die. I prepared to stab into my abdomen, a painful way to go, but deserving to atone for my sins. As I plunged the dagger into myself, the blade was shattered into tiny pieces. In total shock, I looked up to see the angered face of the monster before me. Its smile had inverted, and its eyes looked on with disdain and hatred. However, it looked unhealthy. Its skin was stretched across its cheekbones, making it appear sickly, whereas the night I saw it, it looked like the beast of a normal, healthy young man. I had weakened it by killing those people, but it refused to let me kill myself. It needed my knowledge of its appearance to continue existing. I traveled on, trying to end my life in various ways, but the demon refused to let me die. It only seemed to have enough energy to appear on those occasions, but when it did... It did everything in its power to stop my suicide. A gust of wind would push me back from a cliff's edge. A gun would jam if I tried to fire it on myself. 
Nothing worked. But now, I'm not the one killing me. It's the state. And when I go, I'll be taking the beast with me, straight down to hell where it belongs. So do not pity me, Kenneth. I welcome this chance to sacrifice myself for the greater good, and I hope you live a long and good life across the sea. Your brother, Arthur Mallory. My hands were quaking by the time I had finished reading. The mist man wasn't gone. Which meant Arthur was wrong about the curse passing to those who saw him commit evil. And connecting that thought to how I've been writing this blog, I realized the truth. It didn't matter if you knew what he looked like. All that matters is that you knew of him. I never described him in full, but you guys have an idea of his general appearance. And of his existence. We are all guilty. We are all perpetuating his existence. And now, with this revelation, I was given certainty that I wasn't going mad or hallucinating. He was real. Mist Man. The slow sound of clapping from behind me almost made me shout. I swallowed and can barely breathe. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to confirm my thoughts, but the pace of the clapping grew. I couldn't restrain myself any longer. Inch by inch, I pivoted my head over my shoulder. He was here. He sat at the dinner table, clapping away at my great mistake. He wasn't just some bluish-white hue any longer. Now he had color. His trench coat was a dark brown. His pants and shirt were black, with a red and orange blouse beneath it. It was hard to get a clear image of him, though. Just as Arthur sat, he looked like a smudged oil painting, with the movement of fire. The only crisp part of his appearance were those cruel eyes and the malevolent smile. Then, without warning, he stood up, tipped his hat, and finally opened his lips to say three haunting words before walking towards the door and fading away. Thank you, Mallory. Whether my family had been lying to me about Arthur Mallory, whether they actually knew about the letter or not, I had no idea. For all I knew, the Mist Man had persisted in his existence because of this letter, and only now deciding to reveal himself. Waiting for an age where this information spreads like wildfire and waiting for an opportunity to strike. Perhaps he would just continue as a strange ghostly form that killed. Had I not read the letter. But now, I have no idea what he's capable of. Now that someone has confirmed that he is absolutely real. I don't remember anything after seeing him leave. The next memory I have is I'm sitting on a dirty carpet in the cabin. The letter is laying out before me. I just follow routine, but in the library. I had nothing to search for. My quest was done, so I apologize. I begged to God for forgiveness, and I wept. Today I'm able to bring myself together enough to decide on a solution. I went back to my hometown on bike and typed this up in an internet cafe. I've sent my login information via email to someone I knew in high school, Mary Oswell, and told her to delete this blog tomorrow morning. She'd probably be more than willing to oblige, might even rid of it the moment she reads the email. I have no idea how far this blog has spread. I know it's a following, but I don't know if it's international yet or not, but I can't let it get worse. So I'm getting rid of it. Again, I only posted because I feel that I owed the act of followers the truth. As for me, I'm only a few blocks away from the waterfront. I think I'll go watch the waves some more, before I try to use Grandpa's old rifle on myself. Maybe now that he's been realized, he'll let me die. And once more, for posterity's sake, I am deeply sorry to Jake, Morgan, Lily, Mom, all those people who died by my hand, and to all of you. Sincerely, Daniel Mallory.